Jesus made, every statement Jesus made about himself, he also made about you. He said he was the light of the world. He said you're the light of the world, right? I mean, he goes on and on, and every statement he made about himself, literally, he made about you. You need to start seeing yourself. He said, I and the Father are one. Well, he also said that we and he are one, that we're one together. You need to start recognizing that. If you recognize that, then you are one. When you recognize your oneness with God, then what you're doing is you're not recognizing a differentiation and you start forgetting the idea of quenching the spirit, blasting the spirit. You, you, you don't think in those terms because you're one with him. And it's like, well, I wouldn't quench myself, right? I wouldn't blaspheme myself, so I wouldn't blaspheme him. I wouldn't quench him. You understand? There has to be that where you start to, to recognize your unity with God and your union with God and that communion and fellowship to where you're in him and he's in you and Jesus is in Father and the Father's in you and Jesus is in you and, the and you just get where it's all in there and you can't tell who's what, right? And, that's what, and th you become that more and more as you have your mind renewed to the word of God and you start recognizing the fact that God is good and that the, the message is that God is light, he is life, he is love, and that's who you are. Okay, and so now would it affect your faith? Yeah, but honestly, usually if you are blaspheming the spirit, you're not real worried about operating in faith, right? Usually that has to do more with you're going the opposite direction, just living however you want to do. So now quenching the spirit, uh, there are degrees of it. You can quench the spirit several ways, but just by not doing what the Bible says, you quench him. By not doing what he says to do, you quench him. So there's degrees of that, <coughs> and <coughs> there are greater or lesser degrees of it. But the main thing is not to focus on that as much as you're focusing on the, the easy thing is just to focus on, on the people and their needs. You love God. You love people. You really don't think about you much. You know? And when you're not thinking about you, then you do generally don't quench the spirit. Generally what you're thinking is, Father, this, need, this person needs here. And so you're, you're thinking of how to increase the flow of the spirit and not quench him. Right? Get away from the idea of how can I say it? Again, I, I consider myself a researcher. I mean, I, I look at words. I, I go in, I detail. I'm a detail-oriented person in this way. But it's funny because you almost got to get away from details. <clears throat> See, it's, it's it, like in the military. They'll tell you planning is everything. Plans mean nothing. Okay? Planning is everything. You plan, you plan, you plan. You make a contingency plan. You do this. If the enemy does that, you do this. If the enemy does this, then you do this. And you make plan after plan after plan. But you always have to remember, most plans never survive first impact or interaction with the enemy. So you make all these plans, you get there, and the enemy does something, and then your plans are out the window. But <clears throat> you have planned and planned and planned. And that way, whenever you get in a situation, you don't have to stop and think about it. You have trained yourself to react a certain way. Now, that's called discipline. And so that's what you need to do, is you need to discipline yourself. Oh, and you, you read and you study and things, but I don't get... I, we have to remember, it's, it's such a, you know, opposite side, okay? Two sides, the same coin. God, we have a relationship with him. He's a friend. He's a father. He's with us. He talks with us. We fellowship. We live this life together. It's just life. It's good, right? Which means that if something goes wrong, he's there. He'll help. He'll take nothing to get worried about. It'll work out. It'll be okay. Why? Because God is with you. How can it not work out as God, if God is with you? You'll come through. You'll be okay. And the thing is, you don't get tied up and worried. and Oh, oh I didn't do this right. I didn't do that right. It's not like a business. You understand? It's, now, on, one, on this side, it's not like it's a machine where everything has to be working perfectly in sync. It, it's a relationship. It's God. You know, he's for you. He's with you. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, the power of God is absolutely mechanical. So that's why you can work it like a machine. But that's the lowest level, right? Now, that may be a level you need to operate at at some point. But as soon as you operate there, move beyond it. Move into the relationship. Understand, <clears throat> we're not pointing the finger at people. We're not judging people. We're, we're helping people. We're lifting. Uh, you know, if anything, we're judging the enemy. And the way you judge the enemy is to command him to leave people alone. You understand? And you just love people and you work and you just, it's just life, right? And so, <clears throat> now, let me get back over here real quick. Uh, okay, yep. In, uh, let's see, yeah, we're going to go to page 11. 
Yeah, you remember where we were at? Meat, milk, carnal, spiritual, babe in Christ, mature, right? The Corinthians were carnal. They were babes in Christ, but they were operating in the gifts. So you know all this, right? Remember, we, that's where we stop. All right. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. If you don't have a manual, you can turn there. If you have a manual, you can go to page 11. It says, because <clears throat> they were talking about Melchizedek, uh, Paul writing to the Hebrews at this point is talking about the, the priesthood of Melchizedek and how Jesus' priesthood is like the priesthood of Melchizedek and wasn't like the um, Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood. He says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Now, notice Paul is saying they're hard to be uttered. Why? Seeing you are dull of hearing. So he's telling them, I could say it. It's not hard for me to say. But the reason it'd be hard for me to say is because you're dull of hearing. In other words, I could say it, but you wouldn't get it. So he wasn't saying it was just hard to say. He was just saying you wouldn't get it. Right? Now, he says, for when for the time, so we know time has something to do with something, when for the time you ought to be teachers. So in other words, if you've been in the church very long, now notice the word teachers is plural. All Christians should be teachers. Every Christian should be teaching somebody something. You understand? It should be the Bible, obviously. But he said, and, and if you're in church very long, you ought to be teaching people something, right? When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, man, you've been in church long enough. You ought to be teaching others, and yet you need somebody to come teach you again the very basics of the Word of God. That's what he's saying. Yeah. And, now watch this. Remember he told me, look up there at, uh, at the verse 11. It says, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Well, in verse <coughs> 12, at the beginning, he says, or at the, be, at the end, he says, and are become such. That means they weren't always this way. They became this way, right? Now, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So in other words, we would almost want to say they backslid. Right? In other words, they were at a point where they were getting meat, but now they can't take meat, now they've got to go back to milk. Right? And he says, for everyone, now he describes it, <clears throat> everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, notice, it says everyone that uses milk. Now, using milk is not wrong. The Bible, matter of fact, you are never told anywhere to desire meat. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to desire meat. No, I'm talking New Testament. If I say Bible, I'm talking New Testament, unless I specifically go back to Old Testament, okay? Now, <clears throat> but it says, watch this. You are told to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So what do you grow on? Milk, not meat. You don't grow on meat, you grow on milk, right? So there's nothing wrong with milk, but watch. He says, <clears throat> for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So as long as you're, now we know what a babe is, because he says, for he is a babe. The person who uses milk is a babe, and, they, and as long as you use milk, you're carnal. You know what he said over in 1 Corinthians? You're carnal, and I can't give you meat, I can only give you milk, right? Because you're a baby in Christ. So if you're using milk, then we know that you're a baby in Christ and we know that you're carnal. And we also know now that if you use milk, you're unskillful in the word of righteousness. Right? Now notice he doesn't say the word of God. Now we know he's talking about the word of God, but he specifically says the word of righteous, righteousness. Why? Because the whole basis of the word of God, especially the new covenant, is the fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And if you don't understand your place of righteousness, you will always remain a babe. You'll never take your position. You'll never rise up. You'll never walk in anything. You understand? Right. He says, watch, verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. What is that called? Mature, right? Grown up. Even those, now he's going to describe what full age and grown up and mature is. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You hear that? So as long as you're a babe, you don't understand good and evil. As long as you're a babe, you have not had your senses exercised by use. That means that use, doing, now use means doing something. So that means that growing up has something to do with doing something. You get it? Not just sitting and learning. So he says, but, but strong meat belongs to him at full age. So until you start using something, using the word basically what it's talking about, but you have your, your senses 
developed to the point where you can tell what's right and wrong in the Word of God. You can tell that's good, that's right, that's wrong. That's it. So you can tell. Once you do that, you're starting to grow up. But until you start doing it, you'll never know what's right or wrong because to you it's all theory. So at some point you have to start doing things. Now, he says, <clears throat> we go into verse, chapter 6, verse 1. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the basics, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. He said, look, let's move on. Let's, always, let's quit always talking about faith in God. You know, doesn't that sound strange? Because that's all you ever hear. You need faith in God, faith in God. Well, at some point, you've got to quit talking about it and start doing it. You understand? Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And I've always said, I don't know if he'll find faith, but he's going to find a whole bunch of books and tapes about it. <laughs> Amen? Because we'd rather read about it than walk in it. Now, John chapter 4. <clears throat> it's still on page 11, starting in verse 5. <clears throat> then cometh he, this is Jesus, to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. But, but then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, <clears throat> ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Well, that surprised her that that he would even talk to her. And Jesus answered her. Now watch, he didn't, <clears throat> it's funny because he didn't answer her question. You know what I said? He never answers you straightforward. He always answers with a question. He always answers the question with a question. Okay, right, watch this. Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked of him. And he would have given you living water. <clears throat> the woman said unto him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water? Now, notice, she didn't say, what is living water? She thought she knew what living water was. Well, it's because the Jews understood living water was moving water, right? That, and and she, she knew that he didn't have living water there because he was at a well, and she knew that, you know, was trying to figure out where are you going to get living water? You don't have any way to get the water out of here. And if you read about John the Baptist when he was baptizing, it said he baptized in the River Jordan because there was much water there. Well, that would have been called living water. See, the Jews would never have baptized the way we do in a baptistry because that's dead water. It's not flowing. See, and it's kind of strange when you think about it, but their idea was they would go in, in, in kind of like a bath, you know, like we have a bathtub. The baptistry is like that. It's just water sitting there. And what it is is you would go in with your sins and you'd go in and go under the water and the sins would come off and float on the water. I mean, I know it sounds strange, but that's, that's kind of the mentality that they were working from. Then when they were, they, because the water wasn't running, they just sat there. So when you came back up, <clears throat> it was right there on you. So they needed running water, so when you went under, it floated off. So when you came up, you were clean, right? That was the mentality, right? Now, <clears throat> we think that's funny but, and strange, but it kind of makes sense if you think about it. But the amazing thing here is that <clears throat> when they said living water, they meant moving water. Now, but we know that Jesus, when he said living water, well, he meant moving water also. But he wasn't referring to physical water. He was talking about what? The Spirit. So what does that tell us? Spirit's always moving. We're not waiting for the Spirit to move. He's always moving. You're not waiting on the Spirit. He's waiting on you. Amen? Spirit's always moving. It's the Christians that aren't moving. Okay? Now, watch. He says, <coughs> he said, uh, in verse 12, are you greater, this is a woman asking Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered, now watch, he did not say, yep, sure am, I'm it. I'm the one, you got it. He had no ego, he had nothing, he, he was more interested in this Samaritan woman than he was his own position. Because he didn't, he didn't toot his horn, so to speak, okay? <clears throat> he says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water, the water in the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. You hear that? <clears throat> now, what water was he talking about? <clears throat> the Spirit. 
right? So he said, if you drink of the Spirit, you will never thirst. And yet, all across the world, we have churches get together every Sunday. Oh, Lord, we're so thirsty. Oh, Lord, we thirst. As the deer pants. Oh, Lord, that's my, I thirst after you. Oh, Lord. He just said, you know what you're saying? I've never drank of the water he gave. I've never drank of the Spirit. I don't have the Spirit. Now watch, it even goes further than that. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So what's he talking about? Being born again. So when you're saying you're thirsting, you're saying I am not born again. Because he said the water he's going to give you, you'll never thirst. And the water he gives you will spring up in you into everlasting life. So when you're saying you're thirsty, you're saying I'm not born again. I don't have the water he gives. I'm, I don't have the spirit. You are denying the word and the power of God. Now, by the authority of Jesus Christ, I am telling you today, never say that again. Do you understand? Is there any excuses? Okay. I'm just telling you, don't do it. <clears throat> if they sing that song in your church, just start singing in tongues. Right? Or keep your mouth shut. But don't say it because you deny. You have, if you do, I'm telling you, okay, let me give you a scripture just so you know. If you do that, <clears throat> you are claiming to have a form of godliness but denying the power. Do you understand? Right? Now, you don't want to do that, do you? So don't do it anymore. Okay? And if enough people quit singing those stupid songs, they'll quit playing them. All right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> now watch this. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I, may, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call your husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said unto her, You've well said that I don't have a husband. Because you've had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. Now he just revealed to her that she's an adulteress. Is that right? He, he just revealed that she's in sin. Right? Now watch. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> you notice it doesn't say, and immediately the woman repented. <clears throat> it doesn't say that. Okay? Now watch. She doesn't even repent. She says, I understand you're a prophet because he revealed her sin. She didn't even talk about the sin. She goes right into the religious hot topic of the day, which was where should we worship? Watch. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say, talking about the Jews, the Jews say, he didn't say it, the Jews said it. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, it comes by way of the Jews, because it came by way of Jesus. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Notice, not in a place. <clears throat> right? No holy place. You're the holy place. Right? Okay. <clears throat> For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. Now notice it does not say God is spirit. It says God is a spirit. If you believe that God is spirit, then you are a spiritualist and you are into spiritualism because they believe everything is spirit. But God is not spirit because there are spirits. Everything spirit is not God, right? There's human spirits, there's demon spirits, there's angel spirits, there's God is a spirit. Right? So there are different types of spirits. Right? God is a spirit. He is one type of spirit. He is the ultimate spirit. But he is one individual in himself. Right? You understand that? Okay. <coughs> he says, God is a spirit. <coughs> and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now watch. Verse 25. <coughs> verse 25. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He hardly ever did that. <clears throat> he just revealed he was a Christ. He hardly ever did, and he does it to a Samaritan woman. Why? Because he didn't have to worry about her talking to Jews, because Jews wouldn't talk to her. <clears throat> <laughs> right? So he didn't have to worry about it. Now, <clears throat> now she, he says, I that speak unto thee am he. 
And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why do you talk with her? In other words, they wondered about it, but they didn't say anything. Now, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Now, so far, you notice that we're talking about meat again. <clears throat> Paul was talking about meat. He was talking about milk. He was talking about meat. He was talking about being carnal, talking about being spiritual. Now, was Paul talking about spiritual meat or physical meat? Spiritual meat, okay? Now, when Jesus' disciples said, Master, eat, were they talking about physical meat or spiritual meat? When Jesus said, I have meat to, do, meat to eat that you don't know about, was he talking about spiritual meat or physical meat? Okay, now watch. So, so Jesus was talking about the same meat Paul was talking about. Right? Now, Jesus said, <clears throat> Therefore they said unto him, or to one another, Has any man brought him aught to eat? See, he, they still didn't get it. They still thought he was talking. I mean, come on, these guys were not the sharpest tack in the box. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so there's hope for us. Amen? Amen? Okay. Jesus said unto them, My meat. Oh, he's going to give us the definition of what meat is. My meat is to do, by reason of use, remember Hebrews 5, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So what's the definition of meat? To do the will. Right? You get that? To do the will. To do the will of God is the meat. That means that that's one of the reasons why Paul really couldn't give them meat. He could give them milk because learning about the gifts is always going to be about milk. But until you do the gifts, they don't become meat. See, so everything you hear is milk. You will never hear meat. Now, you may hear different... If you go to the, to the grocery store, you may find fat-free milk, 2% milk, 1% milk, buttermilk, whole milk. I mean, come on. There's five different types of milk right there, right? You'll find all kinds of milk, but it's still milk. Now, some of it is thick enough to almost be meat. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> but, but it's still milk, even if it's... Well, in the church, you can never get meat. If they teach you the word, all they can teach you is the milk of the word. They can teach you different degrees of the milk, right? And when you talk about where we're getting in the meat, no, really what you're getting into is the deeper milk, right? But the meat, the meat is never the milk. The milk is to do the meat. Now, the meat is to do the milk. Get it right. You hear that, though? <clears throat> so the milk is to hear the word. The meat is to do the word. So now you have to decide. Because, see, the, the thing is, what we've done is we've made it, oh, give us the meat, no, meat is for full-grown, people of full age, right? So you don't get, and look, look, the key here is that as you take the milk and you do it. See, our problem is we say we want meat, and we want God to give us meat, which means it's up to God. And if we don't have meat, it's because God hadn't given us meat, so the reason we're not mature, it's God's fault. You understand? All traditions of man go back to pointing the finger at God. You know why? It's what Adam did. Lord, that woman you gave me. She's the one that gave me to eat. I always goes back to pointing the finger, and, and he wasn't even pointing the finger at the woman. He said, Lord, that woman that you gave me. See, he was pointing the finger at God, not necessarily at the woman, but he wasn't pointing the finger at himself. Well, so that's what every tradition of man always goes back to pointing the finger at God. Well, we need revival. Lord, send revival. Well, we don't have revival. Why? Because the Lord hadn't sent it. I can't be revived if the Lord hadn't sent it. But you're never told to sit and wait for revival. See, the Old Testament saints had to be revived. Why? Because they had to get stirred up at times because the Spirit didn't abide in them. They were not alive. They weren't born again. Do you understand that? So they had to be stirred up. They were like a fire that if it's not tended to regularly, it just died down. And you have to stir it up to get it on fire again. That's not us. Amen? We live fired up. Why? Because we're on fire. He makes his ministers a flame. He didn't say he makes them embers. Right? He makes us a flame. We are flames of God. Amen? Do you get this? So now you get the, <clears throat> you, get, you hear the milk. Now see, the beauty of this is God is an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> he gives everybody the same milk. And you decide if it becomes meat when you decide to act on it. When by reason of use, you have your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Reason of use. Not reason of, a point, uh, of an anointing or an impartation. By reason of use. When you get fed up with being normal 
and decide to start doing what you're hearing, always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Why? Because you can always sit there and learn. But when you come to a knowledge of the truth, you, I'm not saying you don't continue learning, but when you come to a knowledge of the truth, you may continue learning, but now you're going to start doing what you learn. Amen? Do you get it? Now, watch. Let's go in here real quick. <clears throat> I got about another two minutes, so we're good. He said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the woman left the water pot. Let's see. Yeah, verse 35. Yep. Say, now watch. He says, say not ye. There are, no, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Now, that's a question. So he's saying, don't, don't you say. He's talking to these guys. He said, look, don't you yourselves say that in four months we're going to have a harvest? He said, that's how farmers talk. We say, hey, four months, we got a harvest coming. Now watch. He said, that's why you talk. Watch this. I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. In other words, you ain't got to wait four months. It's ready now. You hear that? Now watch. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. Now you hear how he's tying going into the field with eternal life? You hear that? Now, I'm not saying this by works. You understand? We don't work to be saved. We work because we're saved. We, we get to work because we're saved. You don't have to. You understand? It's not by works. It is by faith. But if you like James said, you say you got faith, let me see your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Right? Why? Because faith without works is dead. Right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get you at is this. Once you realize this, the whole point, and this is what amazed me. Here he is telling about life, about the spirit coming out of them, <clears throat> about the meat of the word of God, and his meat is to do the will of God. I mean, everything he's talking about is action and doing and helping and going. And then he says, look, you guys say you got four months. You got to wait four months for the harvest. And I'm telling you, the harvest is ready. And if you go out and work, then you will reap wages. Right? Isn't it amazing? The church always puts the emphasis on the readiness of the worker. Jesus only put the emphasis on the readiness of the harvest. <clears throat> Why? Because he knew that the worker he could equip. You understand? <clears throat> now, have you ever noticed, I don't know if this is a big farming community or whatever around here, where you came from is, <clears throat> but back in Texas, where I came from, it was a big farming community. And every harvest, you'd see these people out there planting seed, and the, har the uh, farmer a lot of times might plant seed by himself. You know, he might plant the seed, you might see him out there doing his own thing there. But when it comes harvest time, and the, all the harvest is, is, is growing up and it's ready, then he, they go downtown and they'll find anybody I mean, they hire everybody standing around, right? And they'll hire them, and they say, come work, come work. Well, I don't know. what. You, you don't have to be skilled. I just need bodies in the field that can pull this thing and put it in the basket or put it in, you know, in the bag or something like that. He said, I I'm not worried about skill. I'm worried about you being available. He said, look, we've got this amount of time for this harvest. If this harvest is not out of the field by this date, we will lose the harvest because it will die in the field. Isn't that right? And then you start watching. And when they start harvesting, it's amazing. They will work before daylight, and they'll work till after dark. And they will be out there going through this thing, and they're working. Man, they're hiring everybody, and they don't care who or what. They're just like, come on, let's get this thing. Why? Because we got to get this harvest out of the field. Amen? Now, that's what Jesus was trying to say. He was trying to say, don't say you got four months. It's ready now. If you wait four months, some of it's going to die before you get there. Get busy. Well, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I'm not equipped. Don't worry about that. The Spirit is your equipping. He will equip you. You go. Don't worry about it. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't worry about it. He does. You just go out there and love people. And as you love people, He will work through you to accomplish what needs to be done. Amen? You get that? Now, I'll take one more place here. Where I'm just a minute over. I will take you real quick. You might have to use your Bible, though it's not in the manual. <clears throat> but we were in John chapter 4, so go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <clears throat> now, how long do we have for lunch? What, what time do we come back? Till 2 Oh, come on. You don't need two hours to eat. <laughs> My goodness. <clears throat> I'm probably keeping you off from getting in the sin of gluttony by keeping you over. <clears throat> now, 
Uh, let me see if I can find it here. <clears throat> Let's see here. Yep. John chapter 6. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Well, yep, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, let me see. Okay, yep. <coughs> yep, okay, now. <coughs> let's go first to, we'll go to the, the verse 26. May I start in 6? Yeah, start there. Verse 26, uh, John six twenty six. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, isn't that why pretty much everybody's here? You want to know how to work the works of God. Is that right? Okay, I'm going to tell you how to do it right now. Jesus answered. This is Jesus, right? This ain't me. It's not an opinion. Remember, I don't have an opinion. I have a position, right? Okay. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Now, you want to do the work? See, they said, what do we got to do to do the works of God? He said, no, this is the work of God. You notice the difference between plural and singular? They said, we want to do the works. They were said, how do we heal the sick? How do we raise the dead? He said, this is the work of God. That you believe on him, the work, singular. You believe on him whom we sin. Once you believe on him, you don't do works anymore. You understand? You're not doing the work. Once you believe, the last work you did was believe on him. And once you did that, that was the work of God. And from now on, everything you do is the work of God working through you. So it's not you doing it, it's him doing it. So if it's him doing it, why you got to worry about how equipped you are? Well, I'm not gifted. I don't have to. So what? Don't tell me you're not gifted. If you've got the gifts of the Holy Ghost, that's the best gift you can ever have. Well, I don't have a gift like so-and-so. You got a gift just like so-and-so. You both started with the same gift called the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Why do you want to be like so-and-so? Don't be a copy. Be an original. Amen? Go out and be you. Be the you that Jesus made you to be. Right? Okay, now, he says, watch this. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe you that what, does, what do you work? Here you go. Our fathers did eat man in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, that means of a truth, most assuredly, definitely, without a doubt, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. In other words, you got manna, but you didn't get the bread from heaven. Why? Because he's the bread from heaven. Right? Watch this. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Stop there. What is the bread of God? Jesus, all right? Now, what is it? remember what Jesus told the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, said, Lord, my daughter's got a devil. He said, it's not right to give the children's bread unto dogs. Children's bread. Who's the bread? Jesus. Jesus. Who's the children? We're the children. So Jesus is our bread. But he was talking about healing. Right? When he told the woman, he said, it's not, she said, I want my daughter delivered. And he said, it's not right to give the children's bread to dogs. So he, they were referring to deliverance. But here Jesus said, I'm that bread. So healing is not a method, it's a person. You understand? If he gave us Jesus, will he not with Jesus give us everything else that pertains to life and godliness? See, you got healed when you got Jesus. That's why it's past tense. You understand? It, you're already healed. If you just, if you, right now, if you just go, wow, I didn't know. Okay, yeah, I believe that. You get healed sitting right where you're at. See, I'm, I, I want to do my best to get you healed before I get my hands on you. Because if I have to put my hands on you, you'll go away saying, oh, you got to get to Curry Blake's meeting next time he comes. But if I can get Jesus, if I can get you to connect with him and get you healed where you're sitting, you'll go out and talk about Jesus and not about Curry Blake. Amen? Amen. That's the key. This is, see, we don't, I'm not your mediator. I'm not your go-between. You understand? Jesus is that, and you've got him. So I want Jesus to touch you where you're at, because if Jesus can touch you, then you know how to get him to other people. But if I, if I have to touch you, then all you're going to end up doing is trying to get people to me. Amen? I told you, I didn't come here to be the guy. I mean, I, I'll do it, but it's, I'm trying to get you to grow up so you can be the guy for somebody else. Amen? All right, now watch. He says, here's what I want to get to. Uh, for the bread of God, verse 33, is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. 
they, now watch this, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. You hear that? And he that believes on me shall never thirst. Now, didn't we just talk about that a while ago? He said, if, I, if you drink the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. Right here he says, if you, eat, if, if you eat this bread, you'll never hunger. If you come to him, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. So I've given you two scriptures, the mouth of two or three witnesses, let the thing be established. I give you two plain scriptures right there where Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, said, you will never hunger and you will never thirst once you drink of his spirit, which means get born again and get his spirit. So if you are born again and have his spirit, you should never again say you hunger or thirst because that is saying, I'm your child and you haven't filled me. People say, yeah, but it says over in Matthew <clears throat> that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Yep, that's what you do. You hunger and thirst and you shall be filled. Once you're filled, you're not hungering and thirsting anymore. You can't hunger and thirst after you're filled. When you get filled, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you come to Christ. When you do that, you become the righteousness of Christ, of God in Christ. You get filled. At that moment, you're no longer hungering. So you're not chasing righteousness. You are born again. When you're born again, you no longer hunger and thirst. Quit saying it's hunger and thirst and turn it to zeal. You have a zeal for God. You're on fire and you say, well, I want more of God. No, you want, you want less of you. <clears throat> Which, believe me, that's what everybody wants too. All right? Everybody else wants the same thing. Everybody else wants less of you too. Amen? So... <laughs> So, so the key is just to die. It's not about, oh, God, give me more. God, give me this. God, touch me. God. No, no, no. It's God, show me where I need to die. Show me where I need to die. If you'll show me where I need to die, I will die to that, and then you can live bigger through me. And instead, we have a zeal for God instead of begging God and making it sound like he hasn't given us anything. Amen? Do you see that? So you don't need to, to cry for meat. You don't need, if, you, if you want meat, it's real simple. Go do the word. Amen?